I'm a developer here at ThoughtBot. I like Emacs a lot, and I use it for all kinds of stuff. In particular, there's a mode called org mode, which has basically taken over my life. I use it for writing documents. I use it for organizing calendar events sometimes. I organize to-dos with it. I write all kinds of articles and occasionally blog posts in it. And it's just a, it's just a big old mess. Uh, it's, I mean, it's the best thing ever, but it's, <laughs> it's taken over my life is what I mean. And uh, today, I'm going to walk us through an introduction to org mode with examples and stuff. What a concept. Uh, first of all, who here uses org mode in some capacity? OK, like, like half of y'all. Great. This is going to be fun. Uh, you're going to ask me hard questions that I won't be able to answer. Um, I like to take this kind of loosely, so if you have any questions, just yell them out. That'll be fine. Can you give us some background on uh, versions that you're using right now? Sure, versions that I'm using. Right? Yeah, I am on Emacs 24.5, 24.5, and I'm using uh, org version 8, I believe. I'm using the, the current one. Yeah. I'm not sure specifically what it is, but it's eight something. Uh, I don't think I'll be using anything that will be very version specific. Uh, if you're using anything that's come out in the last couple years, this should all work. Yeah. So, uh, org mode began its life as an outliner. Um, you can start items in the outline with a star. Does this need to be a little bigger? Maybe a little? Yeah. Uh, underneath a header like this, you can uh, add uh, arbitrary blocks of text. Text, text, text. You can expand or contract these as you like, which is kind of convenient. Underneath the header, you can add more items. Uh, at the end of this, you can hit uh, meta enter to create a new thing of the same type. Yet more. You can also reorder them with meta up and down which is kind of convenient. Uh, org mode is basically a markup language. If you've ever used something like Markdown, uh, it's a lot like that. But it's much, much better in a thousand ways that we'll go into. Um, it's also similar to restructured text and all those other similar things. So let's talk about markup. There are a bunch of different kinds of things that you can do markup-wise. You can make things bold with stars. You can make them italic. Uh, with slashes. You can make them uh, verbatim with equal signs. And you'll note that the style changes a little bit as we go along here. Uh, if you really want to, you can also strike through things. I think this looks atrocious, but that's okay. Um, as with any markup language, you can have uh, bulleted uh, list items. And you can also insert uh, links. So here's an example. Let's suppose that I want to link to the lovely uh, orgmode.org page, org.org. I can hit uh, Control C, Control L to insert a link. And it's, this is a little bit tiny here, but it's saying link, and it's prompting me for what I'd like to say. So I'll just paste in org mode there, and that says description. And I'll say org mode, and it has added this link here for me. I can follow that with Control C, Control O, and that'll pop that open in my browser. So that's cool. Um, internally, it's representing this, if I hit backspace here, as a pair of um, bracketed items here. So I've got one pair of brackets with the address in it, and another pair with the text, and then a final pair wrapping around them. So it's just plain text. All of this org mode stuff, all just plain text. If you wanted to, you could open this up in Vim and edit it. I don't know why, but you could. Um, another nice thing about this linking stuff is that you can link to uh, arbitrary other things, not just websites, but files or emails or to-do items. Uh, this is pretty cool. Uh, I have this bound to control C L, and it says here at the bottom, stored display preferences. This is a, an item for my configuration. And if I switch back to that buffer, I can say Control C, Control L, and then hit up, and it'll say File, 
and then it says that file, and then colon colon display preferences. So uh, I'll just call that display preferences, which is the default. When I hit control C, control O here to follow that, it pops open that buffer. <laughs> this is super convenient. Uh, sometimes when I'm editing code, and I know that there are a bunch of things in a source file that I need to change, I'll create a little to-do list for myself with links to those things. It's pretty handy for that. Um, it's also convenient because you can link to things like to-do lists, as I said, uh, or email addresses, if you uh, email messages, rather, if you read your email in Emacs, which I know at least one person here does, uh, which is not me. Uh, one, one day, one day, uh, maybe, maybe next month, we'll see, um, or the month after. So that's all pretty cool. Another thing you can do that some other Markdown formats really suck at is uh, tables. So Markdown in particular is awful at tables, uh, but org is pretty good. So if I put a pipe here, and let's say I want to enter some data, I hit enter, pipe, hyphen, tab, it uh, fills out that, which is very fancy, right? <laughs> Uh, now I can tab between these cells. So let's add some data here. Uh, one, two, buckle my shoe, three, four, shut the door. That's good. So we got this data here. We just tab it and it, it's created. That's cool. Um, a really cool thing that we can do though is that we can rearrange things with meta, uh, meta up, down, left, right. So let's suppose that I decide what we really wanted was three, four, shut the door to be the top. I just drag them around. I can also reorder columns in the same way, uh, which is very fancy. I'm not going to go into this here because it is bonkers crazy complicated, but um, org mode tables are so much more powerful than I'm detailing here. They're spreadsheets. Uh, you can put arbitrary ELISP code. You can have cells be various other things. It's, it's nuts. It's crazy. Uh, there's formatting. Uh, it's super cool. Um, but check that out for yourself because that's a whole other talk. If anyone wants to give that talk, by the way, let me know. Uh, one of the advantages of writing any kind of markup is that you can export to other formats. Um, that is done with the control C, control E command. So let's suppose that I want to export this. Control C, control E pops up this buffer which lists all the different things that I can export it to. Let me embiggen that a bit. Uh, I can't embiggen that. How embarrassing. But um, I can export to iCalendar format because you can attach dates to things, as I'll discuss a little bit later. You can export to HTML, to LaTeX, to Markdown, to plain text. Uh, I have a thing for exporting to Twitter bootstrap formatted websites, which is very pretty. Uh, so all, and, and more things you can, there are arbitrary exporters that people write it's actually very easy to write an exporter. So let's, let's suppose that I want to export this to HTML. I hit H to go into this one, and then O as HTML file and open, and there we go. Lo and behold, here's that. Here's the table, it even looks pretty. So that's pretty cool. Any questions so far? How do you get these bad points, like prettified? Oh, prettified ones? Uh, I'll show that in my config real quick, but it's, it's a one-liner. There's a package that someone wrote that you can add in. It's, uh, uh, it's something like pretty bullets, formatted bullets. Uh, I'll, I'll look at it in a second. Uh, th those are just asterisks, by the way. I think I said that, but I forget if I made that clear. The number of asterisks is like, mm, in HTML, this would be an H1. With two asterisks, it's an H2, and so on. Uh, so we got that. Uh, one thing that you'll notice here in this exported business here is that I, I have this file called example.org and it just titled it example. Uh, that's not a good title for a document. I can add all kinds of metadata uh, to an org document. Uh, the format for that is uh, hash plus and then there are a bunch of different things. Title in this case, oh my, that contrast is terrible. It's a uh, all upcase title and then a colon and then I'm going to call this uh, a gentle introduction to org mode. I, if only I could type. Now, when I save this and when I try and export it again, there we go, change that title. So that's good. Uh, I can do things like um, 
There's a there's an options option, very helpfully called, uh, and that has a whole bunch of key value pairs that let you modify how the document will look. So let's suppose I don't like this table of contents thing. Uh, I, I don't really. I can set TOC to nil, save it, export it again, and it's gone. There are a ton of other options that you can set, like maybe we don't want numbers, maybe we, you know, uh, want to show a little footer here at the bottom, maybe don't. we don't want to show the footer, maybe we want to, all, all kinds of stuff, tons of things we can do. Uh, but that's, uh, that's a simple one. So one of the nice things about writing network mode is that you can uh, include source, uh, source code very easily. So let's talk so, about sorry, source code. Before, before you go on, can, yeah, you, sure. can you export a subset of a network file, like a region? Oh, probably. Yes, <laughs> yep. <laughs> cool, I haven't done that. Um, you control E, then hit Control S, it'll, it'll say you can export the subtree at the top. Oh, you, whatever, man. Control C, Control E. So sure, Control C, Control E. And at the top, you should see export scope. Oh, export scope. That's very yeah. cool. For buffer or for subtree. So you can toggle it between the buffer or the current subtree that you're in. So if I do subtree and hit enter, uh, well, of course, I don't want to hit that. I want to hit HO. Uh, and there we go. It shows just that uh, the stuff there that I was in. Hmm. Nifty. Ah, thank you. <laughs> I did not know that. <laughs> so that's the trick. You give a talk, and then you learn stuff. Oh, I didn't mention this, but you can export to many other formats, too. I only showed HTML, but let's show a, a PDF through LaTeX. Uh, LaTeX is an intermediate format. It's, I mean, it's a perfectly good format for writing things, but uh, you can use that to generate very pretty uh, PDFs. So pretty. And that's from the same source file, which is super convenient. Uh, a lot of people like to, so a lot of people that write papers in, you know, academic subjects uh, use org mode for that because it gives you most of the benefits of LaTeX without having to write all in LaTeX because LaTeX kind of sucks to write in sometimes. <laughs> um, it's super powerful, but I would rather write in this personally when I can. Um, as for source code, uh, you can insert blocks of the form uh, begin source and then the kind of code you want. Let's say Ruby here and then end source. There are also a bunch of shortcuts that are built into org mode. If you hit less than S tab, you'll also get a little source block that gets expanded. That's very helpful. No one wants to write out all that. We can edit uh, a source block in the mode of the language that it's in with control C uh, quote. So let's write a really little factorial function here. That's we're, Let's pretend we're functional programmers, and that's the thing that we do all the time, is write factorial functions. Uh, if it's what, then one. Otherwise, uh, return what, n times fact of n minus one. Seem right to you? That seems right to me. So there we go. That's now in there. I can save that, and when I export it to HTML, uh, it will now claim that I'm not in a project, which it did not do before. How frustrating. I think that's a projectile thing. And I think that's because it wants me to be in a Git project. So I'm just going to do that quick to uh, humor it. There we go, very good. <laughs> and uh, then we have this source code block, which it's not super clear here, but is syntax highlighted. Because uh, I set that up with uh, a pr package called minted, ver pretty. So that's that. I had mentioned that you can use it as a substitute for uh, LaTeX, and you totally can. So you get characters like alpha. Uh, I a question. You yeah. Have a question. Um, that source code block there. Yeah. Is is there a way to make uh, org mode run that code? There is indeed. Uh, we'll be talking about that a little bit later. Uh, yeah, so if we named it, uh, well, so actually, a very easy thing we could do is hit Control-C, Control-C, and it'll evaluate it in place. And these are the results. Uh, 
let's suppose that we wanted to call fact of 5. I haven't tried this, so I'm, I'm really going out on a limb here. There we go, 120. So it evaluated it with the appropriate uh, interpreter and uh, pasted the results in there. How bonkers is that? <laughs> the answer is so bonkers. That's great. It's, I know. That's great. Uh, so we've got these characters. All right. To go back to the LaTeX stuff, I I'm going to cover a little bit more of that later. I'm going to talk about Babel. Um, but we've got these characters here. And let's put those in there. And boom. Alpha to beta. So good. That's kind of down there, but let me embiggen it a little bit. Boop. Yeah. So you can just include org character, uh, <laughs> LaTeX commands in an org document. Uh, if you want to be a little bit more fancy, you can include math blocks. Like suppose we want to say something like uh, O of n log n. That's a thing we would say a lot, right? And let's expand that out. And there we go. That's correctly formatted, so good. Uh, if we want to, we can even say more complicated things. Like, um, we can use the align star environment that LaTeX uh, provides. And. Oh, yeah. I'm <laughs> Don't mind me. I remember LaTeX. I really do, I swear. Let's change those to those and do that again. There we go. And uh, I could say something like 3 times 2 times 1 is. Uh, equal to, well, what, what I have here, I have an example here, I swear, but uh, we can align some stuff here and say that's six plus one, and then give it a new line, and then uh, align those, and that's equal to seven, and hey presto, when we create that, it will put it in there correctly. Uh, this is just HTML, but it's using a JavaScript package called uh, MathJax, and that's just included when org compiles things by, by default. You can disable that if you really want to, but this is pretty cool. Uh, and unsurprisingly, when you export to uh, PDF, it also turns out correctly that we're writing uh, LaTeX here after all. So that's more fancy, I think. Uh, you can also use this for exporting to different things like Beamer. If you like making presentations and you like making them all pretty and LaTeX-y, uh, you can use uh, Beamer to do that which is great. Um, I think I have that in here. It's uh, LaTeX, yeah, as PDF file Beamer and open. Let's see here. This will look a little weird, but yeah. <laughs> Isn't that great? Look at that, even LaTeX to LaTeX. <laughs> man, oh man, solid stuff. <laughs> I don't have that option. Beamer? Uh, so there's a package called ox-beamer, and ox is org export. So there are a lot of package, the packages that are prefixed with ox. And uh, that's the one for Beamer, if you require that. And you may have to do one or two other little things. Uh, that would, if there are such things, they'd be in my config, which is online at github.com slash hrs. And it'll all be, it's pretty well commented. Uh, which nicely ties us into uh, the next topic of literate programming. Um, so we showed that you can evaluate source blocks uh, in your LaTeX file, in your uh, org file rather. Another cool thing you can do is evaluate all of the source blocks in an org file. So I have a really, really simple uh, init.el. Let me just open that up here, emacs init.el. It is a one-liner. I run this command, uh, org babel load file, and that loads up a org document, which is my configuration.org. And what it does is it looks through it, it finds all of the source blocks that are marked as Emacs Lisp, and evaluates them all sequentially. So if we look at the actual config file, it's, uh, I mean, it's just an org document. I use this package called sensible defaults to set some stuff. I set my personal information in here. Um, let's see. Oh, here's my org stuff. I have some display preferences. 
Uh, oh, here's, here's what it is. It's org bullets mode. I set that to true. I believe you need to install a package called org bullets mode also. Uh, you can also do things like hiding bleeding stars. That's where if you have like three asterisks, it'll only show the third one and it'll be indented correctly. Anyway, so what happens is uh, there's this notion called, uh, there's this uh, system called Babel, which is associated with org, which will go through your document, find all the source code in an appropriate language and uh, generate a new piece of source code from that, a new, a new document from that. So that's what I'm doing. Any questions about that part? It's kind of magical. I have a lot of opinions about literate programming. Um, I think it's mostly a pretty bad idea, but for things like this that don't change very much and are kind of intended to be um, didactic, like that people should learn from, uh, I think it's a pretty useful way to do things. Um, also, when I converted over my uh, config into org mode, I found all kinds of crazy duplication and weird inconsistencies and stuff, so this was a very nice exercise. Uh, <laughs> Bad scene. Is that your entire configuration? That's my entire configuration file. Uh, which, to be fair, is almost 1,200 lines long. Um, so, you know, we can expand this out and then it gets wow. pretty, pretty crazy. But, uh, you know, a lot of it's prose, too, which is kind of, oh, hey, I even lint prose. Anyway, good stuff. Uh, I can export this, too, for example. And there we go. There's a table of contents. Yeah, so that's kind of cool. Um, got a lot of code. I do all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, like I said, that's all online. And a as a benefit, uh, it's hosted on GitHub, and GitHub now parses org documents correctly and displays them about as well as they display Markdown. They don't do clever things like evaluating code blocks and putting them into stuff, but yeah. Uh, something I should have mentioned when I was talking about evaluating code blocks is that uh, if you have a code block, and it has some results, you can pipe those results out to, out to the screen, out to the compiled document, but you can also pipe them in as input to another code block. So sometimes people will write code that generates some information and then pipe that into like a GNU plot block to generate a graph of it, <laughs> which is magical. I think that's super cool. Uh, so that's literate programming. Or that's some stuff that I do with literate programming, anyway. Does anyone have any other questions related to that? Cool. So let's talk about to-do stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people use org as its to-do list. What's that? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Are you familiar with the uh, navigation hotkeys for source blocks? The navigation hotkeys for source blocks. I know that they exist. Okay. <laughs> what? Uh, what did you have in mind? So there is one that is um, uh, move to previous and next source block that brings your cursor to the begin source directive. I was wondering if there is one that brings you either to the end source directive uh, or the results directive. Sure. So is there something that will, uh, is there a key command that will bring you from the source code to the results directive or the, the end directive? Um, I'm going to say yes, because <laughs> is there a key command to do something? Yeah, someone, someone did that. I don't know it. Um, what, what I do in practice, I, I use evil mode, and I use the uh, curly brackets to skip up and down by paragraph. And in practice, it's like maybe one extra keystroke. So I haven't bothered with that optimization yet, but uh, I bet there's something out there that would do it for you. I, I'm, I'm very confident, in fact. That just seems like the kind of thing that has to exist. Anything else about uh, blocks or code or anything? So in the configuration file, is that one big file or? Oh, my config file? Like it's just one big old file. Yep. Is it possible to like uh, separate these into separate files, but like overlap into one? I could separate them into separate files. Um, I don't know that that would be of any advantage. Like, right now I can expand and collapse them, and it's pretty, pretty easy to search through stuff. There's only one file I got to grep. I'm pretty lazy about that kind of thing. Um, nice. I, for, for, I mean, normally I am 
very into, yes, let's split everything into separate files and you know, one responsibility in every place and all that good stuff. But uh, for this, I go totally the opposite way. Um, <laughs> Have you tried to uh, use literate programming for anything other than Emacs Lisp? Have I tried using literate programming for anything other than Emacs Lisp? Uh, I have I've played around with piping the results of code into other blocks, like generating graphs and stuff, for more, more or less for fun. Uh, I've done that with Ruby successfully. I haven't really tried it with much else. Um, I actually think literate programming is almost always a terrible idea. If you have, if you have some kind of project, I think good software engineering practices are about making sure that that project can change in the future easily. And I think having a lot of comments that need to, need to be changed when the code is changed also will make it harder to change and will eventually become deceptive because people will not always change those comments. Um, and on and on and on. I have a well-prepared half hour rant on this topic. <laughs> that you can have me unleash later on. But uh, uh, yeah, I, I haven't used literate programming for much other than this kind of thing. And I think it's nice for papers too. Like if I was writing a paper, something uh, in particular, if I was interested in reproducible research, I think that would be a great way to do it. Um, anything that's like more documentation, like documentation focused or like intended for teaching, I think literate programming is a really great model. Um, for things that are not like that, I think it's not a great model. I think if you're Donald Knuth and you're writing The Art of Computer Programming, excellent choice. Uh, if you're not, <laughs> eh. uh, But config files, I think, are a great case for it. They don't change very much. Um, they need to be well documented. People learn from them. So that seems like a great case for literary programming to me. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I actually did a complete 180 on this. I used to not do that at all. I had a ton of tiny little ELISP functions, and I actively did not comment them because I wanted the function names to be the documentation. And uh, I have since realized that that is dumb. Uh, it's just not a good fit for this particular use case. Uh, so about those to-dos, I was going to talk about them. So uh, what, what originally lured me into org mode is not all this neat publishing stuff that you can do, but rather to-do management. Um, I read Getting Things Done, uh, which is a fancy, fancy book about keeping all of your life in a to-do list. And I thought, yeah, I want to do that. But I also like plain text, and I like this clunky old editor from the 70s. How can I combine all of my passions together? Um, it turns out org is great for this. So if you have some bulleted item, and you prefix it with the word to do, you'll note that that turned a weird color. Uh, to do, let's see, explain to do lists. Uh, if I hit shift uh, meta enter, it will create another one there underneath it. Um, one of the things that you can do is that you can cycle through states. So if I have this guy here, I can hit control C, control T, and it will be marked as done. How fancy. I can hit Control C, Control T again, and it'll remove the to-do. And if I hit Control C, Control T again, it'll cycle through to to-do. Um, if I want to, I can change some metadata about that file to say that I want to insert extra states in that cycle, or have multiple cycles even. Um, personally, I use to-do, waiting, and done. Um, waiting for things where I'm like blocked and waiting for someone else. Uh, so that's all pretty cool. No, note that when I uh, did that, it added this little timestamp on the end, uh, which is pretty fancy. A cool thing about org timestamps, by the way, is that you can modify them uh, with shift left and right. So I can be like, oh, let's go to another day. It's kind of cool. Uh, I can attach deadlines to things. So let's suppose I really needed to explain to-do lists today. I can hit control C, control D, and that brings up this, this magical calendar in my text editor, which is bonkers, um, which will let me uh, choose a day. So let's suppose I should have done that a while back. Uh, this is now assigned a to-do, uh, a deadline, rather. 
and I can toggle that with uh, shift left and right and shift up and down to go by month if I want to. Uh, and that's pretty cool, I think. Um, can you start by Haha, <laughs> can I ever? So, uh, <laughs> oh boy, oh boy. Um, if I hit control C, A, that summons the agenda, uh, which is not a thing that I can embiggen either. Damn it. Um, however, this has a list of uh, letters and what they do. Um, among those things, I can see the agenda for the current week or day, a list of all of my to-do entries in multiple files, if I can figure that. There's a little bit of elisp you need to write to set that all up, but it's, it's quite straightforward. Um, I can search based on certain tags. Uh, there are tags. Um, <laughs> Uh, there are all kinds of crazy things I can do in here. Uh, so yeah, I can totally sort by, by stuff. What, what I actually do, though, is I hit Control C, Control X, Control E to archive something when I'm done with it. And what that does is it uh, takes that, that, that um, item, marks it as done, sets that closed timestamp on it, removes it from the file it's currently in, and appends it to the end of an archive.org file that I have. Uh, somewhere else. So I have a list of all the things that I've done in the past like five years, uh, which is kind of neat, and when I did them, and all that good stuff. Uh, so in practice, I don't need to sort by done because they're, they're already sorted by done. I have to ask this question. Yeah. Um, it's, it's got little to do with a board mode or Emacs, but as someone who probably reads Jeff Atwood's blog. Oh, yeah. You, you saw his, I suspect you saw his um, treatise on to-do lists um, maybe six months ago. Jeff Atwood's treatise on to-do lists. What was the thesis okay. on that? It was um, that you should throw them all away. Throw them all away. All your packages, you mm -hmm. know, uh, conventions, whatever, and just go with doing three things a day hmm. because you can remember three things. It's easy. You mm -hmm. don't need to write it down. You don't need to put it in Emacs. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't need to keep track of it. You would know if you got them done. Cool. And, and I saw that, and I've been, I've done so much of this that there's so much history going back to probably at least 1992. And I saw that, and I was an instant believer mm -hmm. for what it was. Sure. But I was curious if you had come across it, and what your reaction would have been to it. Now that you mention it, I have heard it. Uh -huh for the recording that was uh, Jeff Atwood's post on trashing your to-do list and just writing out a list of the three most important things you need to do every day. My response to that would be, how does Jeff Atwood ever remember when he needs to go to the dentist? Um, I never would if I did not have something that told me to. Uh, it's calendar entry for me, but um, I have a lot more than three things that I need to do, and they're mostly things that I don't want to remember. Um, so I, I really need some kind of backlog. I feel that if you keep everything in a to-do list and you're very diligent about keeping it up to date and pulling things off of it and appending things to it when a new thing that needs to be done comes in, uh, that works pretty well. If you kind of do it halfway and have a to-do list of things that you don't regularly update but just sort of looms over you, and is existing at the same time as an unwritten list of things in your mind that you're worrying about, you will have a very bad time and it will not work, uh, I think. In, in my experience, that's what's happened. So I think um, no to-do list is an option. I think it's hard to keep track of stuff because there are more than three things I need to do. And some of those I will need to do tomorrow. So, I don't know. It's also predicated on the fact that you don't necessarily want to remember what you've done. Yeah, that too. Um, the way I, I do it here is I now have a record of everything I've ever done. Um, that's kind of convenient. Every now and then I need to be like, when did I pay that bill? Or, you know, when was the last time I went to the dentist? Or whatever. And I can find out very easily. Um, that's that's kind of useful. Um, yeah. So if you're into that, it's a pretty good way to do things, I think. Uh, if you have a different system, feel free to not use this one. Uh, I will occasionally set up one of these little guys for work. 
uh, you know, like, oh, I know I have like four or five little things I need to do today, and I'll just set up a little separate list. And that it just helps me keep it in mind. Or sometimes I'll just do it on paper. Meh. But, uh, yeah. Do you have it synchronized with, uh, or have it, have it on your computer? Yeah, so I have this synchronized in a folder. Uh, I have a directory of multiple uh, org documents. And I have them syncing to a server that I control through a tool called OwnCloud. And remind me to come back to OwnCloud at the end because that's one of those things I could talk about for a while, but OwnCloud is a beautiful piece of software that I really like a lot. It's, uh, it's like a Dropbox replacement, but it's also um, a Google replacement <laughs> in a lot of ways, uh, which is pretty sweet. Uh, what else? Let's see. Uh, there's the agenda. I just showed you that. That's, that's the most of what I wanted to show you. Um, there are a bunch of other things that you can do with org. Uh, there are things called org capture templates where you hit a key binding and it creates a template for an org item and then you fill it out, submit it, and it gets appended to a file somewhere or creates a new file or whatever you want it. Uh, that's pretty handy. Like if I hit meta n for me, it creates this little to-do item here. And if I type some stuff and then hit control C, control C, uh, it just appended it to my org index file. Nice. Um, we had a whole talk about org capture at uh, Emacs NYC, which you can go look up. So, you know, it's a big deal. It's pretty cool. There's a lot to it. Um, you'll notice that I can attach timestamps to things. Uh, some people manage their calendars in org mode. Uh, you can do that. There's that agenda stuff that I showed you, but there's way more. Um, that's pretty cool. Uh, reproduce one more. Some people, uh, yeah, sorry. I was just going to say that you haven't showed a schedule. I have not. Um, I did not. Let me let me show you the agenda. Oh God, I hope I don't have anything embarrassing going on in my life. No, good. Uh, not much. <laughs> this is gonna be on the internet. I'm writing some. Uh, <laughs> God damn it. Um, I'm writing out some code examples. I'm. Uh, I have a performance review I need to uh, fill in. I uh, let's see. I need to read a book about Haskell. That's important for me to do. <laughs> I have a deadline for one of those things. Um, so this is this is my next uh, my next week. In summary, I don't I don't use the uh, the date stuff very much. I use a more conventional calendar for most of my calendaring, but some folks are very into doing that. Yeah. One, of, one of the issues I've I've had using org mode is you know I I, cap, I capture piles and piles and piles and piles of to dos, but I don't always assign a deadline to them. Actually, uh -huh. searching for to dos that don't have a deadline is found to be a little tricky. So I don't. Yeah. So I would like everything to have a date. Put which it should be done, you know, so it shows up eventually. Yeah, so the, the, the problem was how do you get things done without a deadline, <laughs> sort of. Uh, exactly. Man, story of my life. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, I only assign deadlines to things that have like a really firm time that they need to be done. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I really should read that Haskell book, but there's no deadline on that. And I could say that I need to finish that chapter by Saturday. I do not need to finish that by Saturday. And since that is a made up deadline, that will make me not respect any of the deadlines. And eventually stuff's gonna slip through the cracks. Yep. So uh, I tend just to not do that. Um, because org is hierarchical, I mean, I can, I can like nest to do's in other to do's. So I can say, oh, you know, I've got all these things. Um, because I can nest to do's, I can create projects and they'll have like a series of tasks that I can cross off. So I think every now and then going through your to-do list and like grooming it a little bit, um, just to organize things in a sane way is, is pretty useful. Um, so I, I tend to do that a lot. I mean, not a lot, but you know, every few days I'll be like, what the hell is going on in here? And clean it up a little bit and organize it a little more sanely and that tends to get stuff done. Um, having not to go all GTD again here, with the getting things done philosophy, but uh, for every project, having a next step uh, task is pretty useful. So this is very conducive to that, I find. Yeah. Okay. Were you gonna talk about contactless? Am I talking about contactless? I'm not. Uh, because 
I have not find a great, found a great solution for contact, li contact lists in org. I know that there is a package called org contacts, and I am certain that there are people that use it. I have not found it to be super great. Um, what I've been doing for contacts is using a Unix program called ABook, which is like a dress book, and it's a uh, curses tool. It integrates with MUT very well. I use MUT for my email. Um, I think if you want to manage contacts in Emacs, uh, one of the great old tools is still BBDB, which is the big brother database that monitors all of your emails and adds them to uh, an address book. Um, super good way to manage contacts. A lot of people do that. I mean, you know, a lot of people relative to the number of people that use Emacs for their mail, which is some, uh, and, and it's a good tool for that. Uh, one of the experiences that I had when I was uh, heavy into org mode, and I was, mm -hmm. I was doing some um, accounts management, uh, uh, what, what is that accounting stuff that one does to generate invoices and things of that ilk? I would just say accounting. Time tracking, yes. And, uh, oh, yeah, and I was sure. getting really heavy into programmatic generation of data and tables and reports. Mm -hmm. And um, th I encountered situations where uh, the org mode features that I needed were, didn't exist uh, but for the next version. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I got into a trap uh, I, of my own making. I, I, I you know, certainly plead guilty to. But you know, I, I, I used the dev sources for Emacs, and then I was trying to use the dev sources for org mode, and the two would conflict, and mm. it just got to the point that I was pulling my hair out, and I kind of divorced myself from org mode, but I do remember that it was extremely powerful. Sure. I also moved into more of a Google uh, frame of mind, where I used Gmail, and Calendar, and you know, uh, various other things, and, uh, but for everything else, I use sure. uh, Enix. Is, is that a question? So okay. the question there is, <laughs> Did you get sucked into the uh, temptation to use uh, the new features, which come out at a incredibly fast rate from the org mode developers? Mm -hmm. And I mean, org mode is developed. The fact that org mode is developed uh, aside from Emacs, it, it just would have been so much easier if it were developed within Emacs itself. I think. Sure. Uh, than the arguments pro and con on that, but I was wondering. If Mm. Nah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so, so the question broadly was um, because org and Emacs are developed separately and because there are bleeding edge features in org that may not be compatible with one version of Emacs and you sort of end up with this like race to have both of them bleeding edge and sometimes things break, um, but there are cool things in the new versions of org. Do I, do I get trapped? Uh, like that, and I, I don't really, I, I don't really use that many really cool features in org. I mean, I, I think the things that I do are amazingly cool features, like, uh, um, you know, I, I write, I'm writing a book in org mode, and it's fantastic. Uh, but there are definitely cooler things that you can do, uh, like time tracking stuff, for example, um, and there are all kinds of really fancy new features, and I, I really don't use them. Sorry. <laughs> this is, this is an introduction to org mode. Talk. Um, yeah. Speaking of cool things you can do with Emacs, though, uh, with org mode, um, there is a package called org2blog, O-R-G-2, oh, I have an editor in front of me. Uh, it is called org2blog, and that can be used to take an org document and publish it to a WordPress site. So if you have a WordPress blog, you can write all of your posts in org mode and publish them from the comfort of your editor uh, without ever having to visit the site, which is pretty darn fancy. Uh, if you don't even want that much overhead, which I wouldn't, uh, you can use a tool called org publish, uh, where you can define the layout of a website in org mode or any kind of project actually, uh, and have like a directory of files and uh, call org publish from within Emacs. And it will take that whole directory structure, uh, process all of it through org mode and spit out a website. Um, which is bonkers, but uh, a number of people do that, and it's super cool. Uh, one day, I hope to join them. Uh, let's see. 
there's some other cool things you can export to. Uh, I mentioned Beamer, and uh, oh, I didn't show you uh, Twitter Bootstrap. Did I show you Twitter Bootstrap? Let me show you Twitter Bootstrap. This is kind of cool. Let me export my config through this. So uh, Twitter Bootstrap, or as they prefer to call it now, Bootstrap, is a, um, eh, it's kind of like a framework for designing static sites and making them look all pretty. Um, they're what every startup looks like, essentially, at this point. Pretty much everyone uses Twitter Bootstrap to make their pages. Uh, so there's a exporter called OX-TWBS. I should just write that down. OX-TWBS, and I have that installed. So when I hit Control C, Control E, I can hit W, O, and it will process it. And lo and behold, here's this thing. How cool is that? It's got this, this wacky JavaScript menu thing here on the side. It's, it's all, oh, the kerning. You know, it's great. Uh, this is really pretty. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, so you can do that. You can just skip around and stuff here. Got all my customizations. Um, so that's a fancy one. Uh, another exporter is uh, ox-gfm for GitHub flavored markdown, if you're into that. That's kind of handy if you write a lot of that. Honestly, I just write it directly in it. I don't bother exporting to that, but some people might. Um, let's see, I mentioned that you can do all kinds of scary stuff with spreadsheets in uh, York tables. It's bonkers what you can do in there. You should check it out, it's crazy. Um, uh, the last cool thing that I was thinking of is there's a tool called Org Drill, which lets you define like a, a hierarchy of information and it'll structure them as flashcards within Emacs. So you can have a question and then an answer and it'll show you the question and then show you the answer. Uh, but you can have just this whole hierarchy of flashcards and then run Org Drill and it'll drill you on them. Sounds like a great way to do your GTD review. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> Necessary? Yes, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. So that's pretty fancy. Uh, there's a ton of cool stuff you can do in org mode. That's all I have. Here, with my, with my papers. Um, but do you all have any questions? I'd be happy to answer them. Yeah. Own cloud. What's that? Own cloud. Own cloud. Oh, yeah. Uh, do we have any org mode questions first? <laughs> do, do you use the org publish feature at all? I have been playing with that recently. Okay. I'm kind of, so my blog is currently on Jekyll. Okay. And I like it. Mm -hmm. It's good. Don't get me wrong. Jekyll, quality thing. Um, but, you know, I'd rather be writing org mode than Markdown. And I host it on GitHub pages. And it needs to be just so with just this particular Markdown and uh, I'd rather not do that. So I'm thinking about switching over. I've been playing with that. Uh, the main problem for me has been trying to figure out how to make my old uh, Jekyll links work because Jekyll structures things um, in directories like, you know, 2014 slash 15 slash seven. Sure. Seven, 15, rather. <laughs> Darn smart weather. Um, and then the name of the thing, and uh, you know, I need to figure out how to make that structure work. I haven't figured that out yet, but I'd like to. Uh, so that's, that's somewhere down the road. Uh, it seems really cool. From what I've played with it so far, it, it seems great. If you don't have a structure that you need to match already, oh boy, Audi, would I ever be doing that right now? Mm -hmm. It's nice. Uh, what else y'all got? Yeah. Have you used um, Org Mobile at all? I played with Org Mobile a couple years ago, and I did not like it. It was very clunky. I think it hadn't been maintained in a while. I have heard that there are some people trying to revitalize Org Mobile, but I have not tried it out. I hope they have. Um, mobile Org stuff would be amazing. Orgsley. Orgsley. Orgsley on Android. Okay. It's actually pretty good. Orgsley on Android. Cool. That yeah, sounds neat. Yeah, it's like, like someone just went their own way and left Mobile Org aside, and it's actually... I mean, you can't do any heavy lifting in it, but if you just want to do it, get the journal sync and be able to add and look at stuff, mm -hmm. I, I find it. O-R-G-S-L-Y? Z-L-Y. Z-L-Y? Z-L-Y. O-R-G-Z-L-Y. Orgsley. Hey, sure. Let's see, there's this thing called Orgsley. And apparently it's good. <laughs> yep, O-R-G-Z-L-Y. 
cool. Cool. And I don't know if it's available on iPhone, but. Yeah. I don't know. I'll check it out. There's a program called uh, Drafts for iOS, D R A F T S, and it lets you write. Uh, it's kind of hard to explain, but you write a little snippet of text in a window, and then you can pass it through some template, and that will process it in some way, like maybe add a timestamp or, for example, prefix it with star space to do space, uh, and then append it to a file somewhere, or create a new file, or send it off to some other kind of external service. Uh, and that's a super powerful tool that not a lot of people are talking about, and they all should because it's amazing. Uh, drafts is neat if you're on iOS. Um, any other org related questions? So own cloud is amazing. Uh, if you have a server, uh, it can either be a physical server or it can be like a digital ocean instance or, or whatever else you'd like. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a LAMP type program. It's this PHP application, runs on MySQL. And what it does is it provides you with um, some kind of uh, uh, syncing utility, kind of like you get through Dropbox, which has desktop clients for all the places you'd expect and also mobile clients. Um, I use it for calendars. Uh, so I, I'm not on Google. Uh, so I needed something to share calendars with that lady over there that uh, was not Google. So I've been using I have the server running next to my desk, running own cloud, which does that, and it works very well. You can manage contacts with it and sync those up. Um, the calendar stuff runs uh, CalDAV. The contact stuff runs whatever the equivalent for contacts is. Cardav. I forget. CarDAV, that's it. Yeah. Um, so that's cool. Uh, and there are a bunch of other things you can do with it. Uh, there are a ton of other packages that I've not taken advantage of. Um, if you're running it on a physical server, one of the advantages is that uh, in terms of file sync, your only limit is the size of your hard drive. So I have like a terabyte of sync, which would cost me a lot of money from Dropbox, which is great. Ha, ha, ha. Um, so that's kind of cool. Uh, I'm a big fan of, of uh, OwnCloud. So in terms of syncing with OwnCloud, um, do you use any version control in your work files or? Yeah. No, I, I've played with GitAnnex, and I've thought about doing that, and I haven't. <laughs> uh, GitAnnex seems super cool. Um, I've also thought about setting up a, uh, like, like something to, like, like a notification system on my server, where when those things change, it'll make a commit. Um, there's, a, there's a really cool tool called uh, ENTR, I think it's called, which not a lot of people know about. Uh, it's like a generalized iNotify tool. Okay. Um, this is kind of a tangent, but I think ENTR is amazing. So I just need to just need to tell you that that exists. But um, I don't know that I would use it for that, but it's super cool. Uh, but if, for example, like you wanted to regenerate C tags or something all the time, ENTR would be a great tool for that. Um, so this own cloud thing is. It, you have the server, and you've got a huge amount of data out there, and you you manage backups and things of that ilk. You do all the maintenance. Yeah, it sits next to my desk. Okay. It's not that hard. Um, it doesn't change much. I I you know, every six months I log in and update all the packages and leave it alone. It's just a Debian stable running there, okay. not changing. So yeah. your your own cloud calendar information is separate from your org. It is totally separate. I do not make those talk. I have not integrated uh, my calendar stuff with org yet. Not sure I ever will. We'll see. Um, yeah, OwnCloud's super cool. It's all uh, GPL'd. It's free software. Uh, so you can install it on whatever you'd like. Uh, I think you can do mail through it. I haven't. I, I use a different service for mail. Um, but uh, it's super cool. You can also uh, I think you can also buy shared hosting through them to host an own cloud instance. I don't know why you would. It kind of feels like it defeats the purpose, but hmm, whatever. Uh, that's probably pretty good too. Yeah. So just uh, about the calendar, it's really easy to get the org stuff out into iCal, mm -hmm. which then you can like maybe push the server and import into 
your calendar application, mm -hmm. God help you going the other way. Yeah, like I down, I've, down, down and back into org. That's the part I'm still trying to solve. Yeah, two way sync seems like. super hard to me. Like but, I have a desktop calendar application, and it can barely do two way sync, like reliably. So I I don't have a lot of hope for doing that with org, but I'm sure it can be done. There is a uh, org gcal uh, calendar you can use. It works reasonably well if your calendar's not very fancy. I don't use Google Calendar. But yeah, yeah. I'm so uh, the, the comment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it's hard to replace Google Calendar. Damn. Um, the the comment was that there's an org uh, org uh, gcal package which syncs well with Google Calendar, uh, which is cool. I'm glad. Anything else? Org or own cloud or otherwise? Alrighty. Uh, we have a lot more Greek food there to eat, so get on that, guys. Thanks very much. <laughs>